Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vince Carr, and I am the Counselor for Education for the American Guild of Organists. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, the first in a series of six around the topic of organ teaching. I'm indebted to my predecessor, Don Cook, for all of his work in assembling the presenters and topics over these last several months. How nice it is to be able to connect and come together in this way, even though we might feel far apart. These webinars represent part of the programming for this year's Committee on Continuing Professional Education, which is led by Frank Crozio. The committee works to provide valuable education opportunities for our members, and we felt that there was a tremendous need for online programming this year most especially. We begin today with a presentation on building an organist's artistry through repertoire by Stefan Price. Our presentation will last around 40 minutes and will be followed by a question and answer session. You may submit your question by typing it into the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Without further ado, I now turn the screen over to Stefan Price. Thank you so much, Vince, and thank you to the American Guild of Organists for extending this opportunity. This is a wonderful six-week webinar series, um, Mondays at 4 p.m., and I encourage you to tune in each week. My name is Stephan Price, and I'm on faculty at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, and we're going to be talking about building an organist artistry through literature choices. Um, I decided to choose this topic for two reasons. Uh, the first, it pertains to my research at Indiana University with my teacher and advisor, Jeanette Fischel. Um, I did research on this topic about building one's artistry through technique and research and performance practice and matching that with different musical styles. And the second is my experience teaching here at Ball State. Um, I'm starting my third year, so I'm still in my beginning stages as a teacher, but um, I've learned so much and I've developed um, some techniques that I have found to be helpful with students. And also there have been questions that um, I, I still I, I have, haven't quite answered yet. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A session and engaging with you after the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you now. So you can see a PowerPoint. Okay, so um, before beginning any piece at the organ, posture is very important. Um, it's important in order to uh, have ease of access at the console. It's important for the weight of your, your thighs, your lower body to be evenly distributed on the bench. Um, it's important to find your center because you're gonna be reaching with both arms, your center at your sternum outward to your shoulder joints and just being aware of the upper arm, the forearm, the wrist, hands and the fingers. There's a wonderful book, What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body by Thomas Mark with commentary by Roberta Gary and Tom Miles. And um, this book is just absolutely wonderful because it talks a lot about mapping the body, understanding the joints, um, and just finding your core on the bench. Um, another thing is that it really addresses the challenge that organists have by not being able to plant their feet on the floor because our feet, you know, we're always moving. And the challenges that come with that as far as how we have to hold our upper body. So I really encourage you to look into this book if you haven't yet done so. So the presentation, I've uh, basically sectioned the presentation into three parts. The first is lyrical styles and I will be using the pieces listed in the PowerPoint presentation. The arabesque is a wonderful piece because you start off with a right hand melody and chordal accompaniment. Um, and for teachers, this allows you to work with your students as far as phrasing and expressivity. Uh, the Nunbitten Wird in Heiligen Geist by Buxtehude 
you then get into ordinary touch and playing in the lyrical style using ordinary touch, which is different from compared to a romantic touch. And then In Quiet Mood by Florence B. Price, the African-American female composer. Um, some characteristics when dealing with lyrical styles, um, you usually have a slower attack and release into and out of the key. Questions uh, arise concerning inflection within the musical line. How does one create inflection so that every note isn't being approached in the same manner? And then phrasing, where does the phrasing begin? Where is the peak of the phrase? And then where does the phrase end? Uh, the perpetual motion pieces, I will talk about um, are the Toccata in E minor by Johan Pachelbel and the Canon in C major by Robert Schumann. The Pachelbel is a great piece because it's not very long. Uh, it's sectional and each sex, uh, section has its own affect. So you're dealing with a variety of different touches. The Canon in C major is in perpetual motion um, and it's in the trio form. Again, really allowing you to focus on the different musical lines. And uh, with the characteristics concerning perpetual motion, you usually are dealing with an active finger. Um, you're dealing with note groupings and understanding where your groupings are uh, because it can be very easy to get lost amongst the sea of notes in perpetual motion pieces. And then again, you're also dealing with phrasing. Where does the, the phrase start? Where is the peak? And where does it end? Also with perpetual motion, um, because the fingers are active, you're also being aware of how much weight you need in the hand or how much weight you, you don't need. And so the way that you hold your hands on, on to the key and place your hands on the keys also um, is something to be aware of with perpetual motion. Uh, for the section on chords, I'm using the pasticcio from the 10 pieces by Longley. Um, uh, I chose this piece because you're not playing chords throughout the entire piece, but again, it's, it's sectional and the A section returns. So once you've learned the first page, it returns later on in the piece. Uh, the Mendelssohn, Allegro Maestoso e Vivace from his Opus 65, number two, here you're dealing with chords and counterpoint. So it's not just one line, but multiple musical lines that you're giving your attention to. And then the Minuet Gothique and the Suite Gothique by Buelman, uh, chords in perpetual motion with the melody on top. Some characteristics are a forward motion with the hand when playing the chord, using the whole arm for support as well when playing the chord, and placing an emphasis on the melody. And uh, one of the main challenges that I have found so far um, when working with students and playing pieces that have big chords is approaching the chord in a manner that prevents the wrist from becoming locked. Okay, so those are uh, the sections of this presentation and some, some basic concepts. And now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then we will move on to the video examples. We will begin with the arabesque, 24 pieces in freestyle by Louis Vierne. This is a great piece to begin with concerning the lyrical style because it starts with a single D in the right hand that the student can focus on and a simple accompaniment in the left hand on the first page. Um, it then goes on and it adds more voices, but the A section returns at the end, and this piece can be found on IMSLP. We're just gonna focus though on the first page. That's 
a new phrase. Coming on the new phrase here. Uh, timing is so very important in this piece and because you have nine beats to experiment with timing again this is why this piece is so great um, because you can experiment with rubato especially robbing peter to pay paul and moving forward with the musical line in measure four of the piece there's a crescendo marking and um, a sense of moving forward and energizing the line forward can help with projecting the crescendo. As you get to that peak, uh, a sense of arrival to that peak and pushing towards that peak as a goal is very helpful. Having goals as far as where the phrase begins, where there's a peak and where there's, there's an end, is, is helpful in, in this style of music. And so the, the motive repeats. Um, when I had the fast moving passages, I was giving a bit of emphasis to the first note and then I fall. Preparing the hand over the notes before I play them also is helpful um, because then my fingers just simply fall. But I am trying to, to give a sense of phrasing to that by placing an emphasis on the first note and then falling. The next concept with this piece would be the idea of legato phrasing. And we know that Vierne was so very good with this, given the accounts of people that heard his playing. What is legato phrasing? So legato phrasing um, is basically connecting one phrase to the next without break, but playing in such a way where the audience or the listener will be able to recognize that a new phrase has started. Um, in this instant, using a agogic accent, uh, where you're basically playing with time at the beginning of a new phrase, can help to achieve this without breaking the, the legato. Here's an example new phrase. You move. That whole idea of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Taking time at the end of the previous phrase into the beginning of the next phrase. Then moving along to make up the time. And so it matches and supports the crescendo marking where you're pushing the line ahead um, that's indicated in the score. Um, so this is why the legato and over legato context is so important and knowing uh, where you want to implement an over legato and how much because it supports this idea of legato phrasing 
where you begin a new phrase without breaking the legato touch. In contrast to the Vierne, the Buxtehude setting on Nubentenvir den Heiligen Geist, uh, 208, that's the setting that we're talking about, uses ordinary touch and more swinging from the knuckle. The attacks and the releases are going to be slower, but the concept is still the same that you want to be expressive in playing. Here, the sections and the breaths are in smaller sections outlining the ornamented chorale, but each motive passes you to the next. Here, I'm also allowing the key to lift my finger. I'm not doing a fast attack out of the key when I release the note, but I'm allowing the key to push up my finger. On the long notes, I help that by allowing the knuckle to raise, and also that gives a sense of crescendo through the long notes. The same in the accompaniment. Staying close and preparing the notes before I play also help. Um, this not, does not require a lot of weight, as we'll talk about in the chord section, where chords do require weight. It's delicate. So again, always having your body language at the instrument represent the music. The same for the pedal, preparing the motions in the pedal. Ordinary touch, there will be space, and you'll press the key down, uh, but it won't require a lot of weight. The next piece, In Quiet Mood by the African-American female composer Florence Price, is another great piece to build one artistic expression concerning the lyrical style. You have a melody in the left hand and a chordal accompaniment in the right hand. And again, a slow attack into the key and allowing the arm and the hand to do most of the work for you will help you in expressing the, the style and the legato touch. Larger intervals will have more of an over legato and smaller intervals um, will be less so. In the right hand, you have a chordal accompaniment in the price piece. Here, there's interest drawn to the top line, which the audience will hear. The inner voices rock back and forth like a cradle. It really creates that lullaby effect. And together, here we're in 4 4, but I want to project a macro beat of two. And again, um, you as the teacher working with your student can decide on all of these artistic decisions um, and incorporating uh, the beat that you want to express. But again, slow into the key, taking your time of a, of a slow attack and a release will help.
Um, I also did some sharing in between the manuals just to help out with the legato. Of course, that will depend on the size of your hand and where you place the accompaniment and the solo. In the Toccata in E minor by Pachelbel, which is a pedal point Toccata, um, the opening involves the left hand, which is outlining the E minor triad, and the right hand responding. Um, it's a very improvisatory piece, and so um, this is a, encouraging the student to experiment with timing of the musical line and how much freedom they have and also uh, establishing the opening section of the free work, which establishes the key and the affect and the mood. Here, thinking about placing more emphasis on the first beat and then making up the time with the rest of the measure can help the student have a goal within the perpetual motion. It also helps the student to not get lost amongst the sea of notes. Um, so that is the opening of the Toccata. And again, just like with the Vierne, you can experiment with going too far and over-exaggerating and then being more nuanced with, with your freedom. Uh, but clarity is very important. It, it involves a faster attack into and out of the key and more of an active finger. P preparing the note before you play and staying close to the key is also essential in perpetual motion because of the speed. Um, you don't want to be too high or too far away from the keys because that will require more work on the part of the student. So you're also helping the student to understand and um, experiment with control of the finger. So I will play the opening measure again and then our goal will be the cadence and the second measure. Here we have a phrase elision because the cadence is also establishing the new section. section we have the main notes that are in quarter notes in the right hand and then we have the inner motive So that's in the, the background, the inner voices, and then the main melody and quarter notes are in the foreground. So you're dealing with having the student listen for the different voices and how they want to emphasize certain voices to stand out as far as certain voices being louder and other voices being quieter. If I put that all together, Again, I'm right on top of the key. Um, my wrists are light. I'm out of the key with the finger action because I don't want to have weight in my hand that bears down my hand, but keeping my hand nice and light, which allow my fingers to move. Okay, the next section we have scalar passages in the Toccata. So this is why scales are so very important for, for fingering. Of course, it depends on if you're using modern fingering or early fingering, again, for the teacher to decide based on the context of 
the student. Um, here, again, goals and a sense of where you're going is so important to establish in perpetual motion because it lets you know where your rest posts are, again, so that you don't get lost in the sea of notes. <laughs>
The next piece, the Canon in C major by Robert Schumann, German Romantic composer, um, is a canon at the octave. We start with the first motive. And the canon comes in at the octave on the third beat. So it's like a chase between the hands. Here you have a pedal that's repeated and then you also have a moving line. Same thing in the left hand. Here, this is a relatively active finger. Again, you're gonna be close to the keys. The hands are gonna be also light. And uh, you wanna create this sense of descending and falling. That's our first quarter note. And the quarter note is followed by a tie. So we're gonna squeeze that tie for all that it's worth before we move on. Um, then we have an, an arpeggio in D minor, and that's on the fourth beat, and we can take a little bit of time as we arrive to the first beat, similar to what we did in the Vienna. As you go on and, and, and so forth. Here, the motive again moves downward, and I like to think of it blossoming and opening. So the hand also is gonna reflect that. Again, it's helpful to have the student understand that their body language at the organ should reflect the music. Um, even though there is a lot of finger action and the notes are moving, what is the macro beat or what is the bigger picture that you want to focus on instead of each individual 16th note. Placing the hand and preparing it over as many notes as possible is also helpful because then that just allows the fingers to descend into the key. this is a great piece for perpetual motion and also the trio form because you can do combinations of right hand pedal left hand pedal working with the metronome using different practice techniques um, and then putting all three voices together and there's also repeats as well so when you've learned one section that section is going to return um, so it's it the student will not be too overwhelmed and it's again helping the student to not lock their hand and lock their wrist but keep a sense of lightness in the hand and the fingers moving I would like to begin with the pasticcio from the 10 pieces by the 20th century French composer Jean Langlais. As a side note, on November 9th, Dr. Anne Lebunsky from Duquesne University will be closing out the webinar series and she will be talking about the life and the works of Langlais, so you don't want to miss that. Okay, this is a good piece, the pasticcio, to start with because you are not required to play chords over a long period of time. And there are different expression markings in the score um, that indicate different touches that the player wants to go for. So here you have a triad in the right hand. And um, there's the melody that is on top.
It's helpful to think of playing the chord with a forward motion versus a vertical motion. Dr. Wilma Jensen, who has uh, recently given many workshops and is currently writing an addendum to organ method books, um, will be talking about this. And she suggests having a sense of support that comes from the gut outward. So thinking of the energy starting at your core and your center outward, that gives you the boost to move forward. Also, the elbow supports you as well, and it's, it acts like a shock absorber to help you support yourself in playing the chord. As soon as you play the chord, you want it to release the hand. Remember I mentioned the challenge is to not lock the wrist. You can start off slowly just to get the student to move forward and release the hand versus locking the wrist. So here we begin with the quarter note, which is going to be longer, followed by eighth notes in the first measure. And there's a staccato indication, which indicates to the player that this is non-legato. Toward the end of the pasticcio, the A section returns on a bigger sound featuring the principles, the reeds, and the mixtures. Here again, you want to listen for the melody and make sure that the pipe is speaking fully and that the air is allowed to enter the pipe. So um, adjusting your touch is very important, as we all know, when playing any organ, but especially when you're on a louder sound. Um, a difference is that you have a moving middle line within the chord in this section. Um, whatever fingering you choose, that middle line, you want the finger to be active and out of the key. In the next piece, by Felix Mendelssohn, the Allegro Maestoso y Vivace, from his second sonata in C minor, here we're dealing with chords and also counterpoint. You have a melody on top, but you also have interesting counterpoint underneath that melody that serves a particular function as far as the voice leading. Uh, we all know that there's been much scholarship and research into the phrasing of Mendelssohn and his organ works, and so that's up for the teacher to decide how they would like to approach that. Um, but it's important to help the student make artistic decisions as far as how to bring out the different musical lines. Here's the top voice in the Mendelssohn. Here are some of the inner voices. And now all together. We also have the pedal line as well that's an important part of this movement. 
When playing the pedal, um, to get a legato touch similar to the hands, you reach and press the note down. You're using your toe and your heel. Um, and also just thinking about a lateral manner of approaching the motion. Again, it's helpful to have the full weight of the leg on the bench and to have that weight extend downward into the leg. And preparation over the note before you play it is also very important. In measure 16 of the Mendelssohn, where the new section began, again we have different voices now written and ascending in a chromatic fashion. Here's the top voice. Um, and the other voices you have repeated notes such as the alto. And again, keeping the thumb nice and light uh, helps with those repeated notes so that they're not too heavy. You have the interesting musical line in the tenor. Now all together. In the next piece, the Minuet Gothique by Vuelman, French Romantic composer, from his Suite Gothique, which is popular amongst organists, um, here we have chords in perpetual motion. Um, it is even more essential for the teacher to work with the student in making sure that the hand is not locked, but always moving because we are in perpetual motion. Uh, you also have different expression marks such as tenuto markings and staccato markings, which again give a different affect and approach to the way you're going to play the chord. And here the melody is on top. Here are the inner voices along with the top voice. And again, I'm placing the weight on the outer portion of the hand to emphasize the melody.
Uh, okay, so that is the, the presentation. Thank you so much for watching. And I think now I'm gonna turn it back over to Vince. Thank you, Stefan, so much for that presentation. Right now we have an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, since this is a webinar, we won't be able to host you visually uh, with your question, but you can certainly enter it into the chat and then I can relay it over to uh, Stefan. So we're open for questions now about anything from Stefan's presentation. I feel like the old telethon here. <laughs> we're waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> Okay, beautiful presentation. What have you found to be the most common problems concerning weight distribution in the hands and feet? Um, usually when a student is having problems with weight distribution, it's because they're not sitting properly at the bench. Um, sometimes the shoulders, if they come to the ears, then that is not allowing the full weight of the arm to be a part of the hand and the fingers. And it's like they're holding their weight back versus allowing their posture and, and weight distribution to evenly balance. So, um, and also sometimes the way that they are holding their hand, if their thumb is locked or tight or if the wrist is tight as well, and you can just experiment with that just by tightening your wrist, that, that makes the thumb even heavier and the thumb is already the heaviest digit of the hand. So just allowing them to relax the palm, relax the thumb, um, and then also giving to support to each finger, playing each finger behind as if it has a hand of its own. Um, also helps with weight distribution too. So, but yeah, it usually starts with posture. That's, that's what I've, I've found. Okay, we have a comment from Alan Jordan. Very nice, Stefan, thank you. Will the slides from the PowerPoint be available? Yes, I will um, organize that. Let's see, and I can put my email in the chat if you would like to email me and I can send those to you. And we'll also, when we provide the recording link uh, behind the website interface, we can provide the PowerPoint as well. So that'll be available to any of the uh, attendees. All right, any other questions for Stefan? Uh, here we go. I enjoyed this very much. Watched mainly to gain additional ideas for teaching. Perhaps I overlooked this, but in the future, could we know the scores and editors in advance? Yes. Uh, I hate to bring gender into it, but as a mother with a little more weight on the bottom of my body, I really have a hard time balancing. I am always putting too much weight in my hands to balance. Do you have any tips? Um, so that's a very good question because everybody has a different body type and all of my students, I've learned this from working with them as well. Um, so it's just a, it's a matter of uh, your placement on the bench and how far forward or backwards that you're sitting. If you're sitting too far forward, that naturally places through gravity more weight in the lower legs. Depending on how tall you are, I'm not sure how tall you are, you could try sitting slightly um, or as far back as you can on the bench and that will just kind of help to even the weight of the lower body out. But of course, it, it will depend on your height. And then allowing the, the natural weight of the leg to just hang and dangle off the bench as well can help to just evenly distribute that weight in the lower body. Great, thank Great you question. for your question. Uh, we have a question from Jeanette Fischel. When do you move from the fine electropneumatic organ in Sursa to a mechanical action organ as a student is developing various touch and technical concepts? Um, I say, you know, as, as right away, I don't think that a person should necessarily start on an electric pneumatic first and then move to a mechanical action. You can uh, experiment and have lessons and sessions on both instruments 
uh, right away. One will inform the other. Playing on a mechanical action instrument will help inform your touch when you get to an electric action instrument. Um, and there are things about playing on electric action instrument that can also help you when you get to um, a mechanical action instrument. So I would say as, so as soon as possible. Great. Uh, we have a question from Diane. In the Mendelssohn, what do you think of more choppiness or thinking of trumpets? Yeah, it's definitely a fanfare. It's definitely a march, the Mendelssohn. Um, so uh, maybe you were referring to over dotting the 16th, pom, pa pom, 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 pa pom. Of course, this all will depend on the room that you're in and the acoustic that you're in. The danger can be to get too choppy and that affects the speech of the pipe and, and the sound that's coming from the pipe. But definitely, it's definitely a fanfare, it's upbeat and it's a march, yeah. Stefan, I think people have been very impressed by your repertoire choices, a very diverse and a lovely array of pieces. So we have a question here. I'm curious as to when you started using this repertoire with your students, how has it affected your students' musical development? Um, it's definitely been a journey and, and choosing pieces for my students because the challenge is choosing a piece that's challenging enough for the student um, to, to learn, but not too hard where, where I'm discouraging the student. So it's definitely been trial and, and error. Um, I would say with the lyrical pieces, I've started pretty much every student on one of the 24 pieces in freestyle by Vierne, whether it was the arabesque or the versus. Those are just great teaching um, pieces because they offer a variety of textures, the collection, the 24 pieces. Uh, the Pachelbel, I decided to start students who had not experienced Baroque touch or um, Baroque technique, starting them with that piece before we begin even a little prelude and fugue, just so they can get this idea of freedom and the different gradations of touch within the Baroque uh, repertoire. And again, with the chords, um, the long lay I've used quite a bit, again, because uh, the A section repeats itself and you're not playing chords over a long period of time. And then you can really um, work with the student and training them how to approach playing the chord. Um, so yeah, it's been about, this is the beginning of my third year now that I've been working with these pieces of my students. And they've affected my students' musicality and um, artistry because I noticed the students are then able to apply the techniques with these pieces at this level. And then when we uh, move through the repertoire to a more advanced piece, those techniques stick. So with the lyrical style, being slow into the key as you're moving through more advanced pieces. With perpetual motion styles, taking the weight out of the hand, being closer to the key with the chords, always then going forward versus just vertical. So definitely the techniques have sticked um, as we've moved through from beginner to intermediate to advance. Yeah. Great, thank we have a, a comment here from M. Servi. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation as an aspiring teacher. I appreciated the vocabulary used, thank you. Well, thank you. And we have one final question here from Jonathan Stark. My colleagues and I have spent much time debating the role of basic piano techniques, scales, arpeggios, etc., as a foundation for organ playing. What are your views? Uh, scales are so, so, so very important. Um, one of my other mentors, Dr. Wilma Jensen, who I mentioned, she practices her scales every day. And every time I talk to her, we get into a discussion about scales because you find those, pattern, those, those patterns and pretty much any piece of perpetual motion that you find from Baroque music to Romantic music. And so when your hand has already been trained to do the fingering for a scale in a particular key, when you see that scale in a piece of music, then it's, it's almost like motor memory because you've rehearsed it so much. You can automatically sit down and usually play the scale. So scales are absolutely essential. They're also essential in just helping the fingers to move, attack and release, right? And then pivoting as well. So getting uh, motion in the hand. I had a student who was very enthusiastic but had trouble simply moving. Everything was locked. So we spent six months just on scales and the improvement and motion and movement uh, in a lateral manner at the keyboard 
was the difference between night and day after spending six months on scale just in helping the student feel comfortable to move at the keyboard. So yeah, uh, essential for any keyboardist. And there's a follow-up there whether the scales are practiced on organ or piano or both. Um, I would definitely do piano. I myself do about 15 to 30 minutes of scale practice before each of my practice sessions on the organ, at least five days a week. So I would certainly do um, piano, but then also organ as well, right? Uh, but certainly starting off with the piano. And lastly here, can you describe how to work on scales, contrary motion, legato, I, I guess what types of techniques within the scale practice? Um, so, uh, yeah, a variety of techniques, parallel motion, just the important thing is how is the finger moving into the key, getting the finger moving, swinging from the knuckle into the key, parallel motion, yes, contrary motion, um, legato, I like that, so listening to touch and the sound that you're, the tone, the tone that you're producing from, from the piano with the scale, is there an evenness of tone, is the finger attacking the key evenly uh, to get an even tone. Uh, so yeah, all of those techniques are helpful and you can choose a certain technique if you wanna work on a specific concept, whether it be tone production, movement, um, et cetera. So yeah, all of those are, are great. Thank you so much, Stefan, for a, such a dynamic presentation. Uh, one of one of the things we're going to do with these webinars is give people a chance to see uh, the committee members. So our little exit here, our closing uh, well wishes are going to be offered by the director of the Committee on uh, Continuing Professional Education, who's Frank Crozio. Uh, but thank you again, uh, Stefan, for everything you've done and presenting this for us today. So I'm going to turn the screen over now to Frank. Thank you, Vince. Good afternoon. My name is Frank Crozio, and I'm a member of the Committee on Continuing Professional Education. On behalf of the committee, we'd like to offer special thanks to Dr. Price for his wonderful presentation today, and to each of you for your participation and questions. There are five additional webinars in this series, and we hope that you'll be able to participate in as many of them as your schedules and interests allow. The next webinar will be held on Monday, October 12th, and will be presented by Dr. Jonathan Hall, who will speak on the new HEO Achievement Awards. We hope you'll be able to join us and look forward to seeing you then.